All right, hello everybody. Welcome back live at Drew's house, another edition. Hope everybody's doing well. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Drew. This, that's a Christmas tree yeah. and also a pumpkin because it hasn't gone bad yet. I, I didn't really like look up until we first started the show. I just noticed our Christmas tree. Yeah. <laughs> that's, did you just put that there? No, it's been there for your last couple of shows. It's been in the background. The tree? No, it yes. has. It's not, a, it's just a little tree. It's a fake one. A little fake tree. But, I'm um, not sure it has. Mm -hmm, it has. I've noticed it. Really? Yeah. Surprising I didn't. <laughs> um, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Good. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. It's crazy. December is going by really fast. Mm, 2020 was a weird year. It feels like if you give me dates from last January, it feels like forever ago. Mm. But like, I don't know. It does kind of feel like it's going fast. I don't know. It's this weird thing. Sometimes it feels like yeah. it's flying by, and but it's really kind of a slow really drag. It's really slow. I don't yeah. know. It's weird. Um, you know how much we love having musicians on the show? Yes. Well, today, you have a musician today? I do. Oh, uh, Why are you thinking about staying Well, now? no, I have to go. <laughs> you have to go. <laughs> okay. um, but we're introducing uh, singer-songwriter Will Daly to the house mm -hmm. um, and French horn player Hazel Dean Davis, who are also big parts of this. Um, you've probably seen it. Uh, it's work being done for the New England Musicians Relief Fund. Mm -hmm. um, trying to support these musicians who are going through a very tough time with no work, especially a lot of these people that live off the bars and the theaters and all that stuff. It is a tough time for them. And uh, this is a great fund that is trying to support them and pick them up through a tough time. So that's what we're, we're dealing with today. Oh, awesome. I don't know um, much of Hazel's work. I have heard Will. Will pops up with the old uh, Spotify from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, so I know him a little bit and I've seen him in some circles. So uh, I'm excited about this. Should be good. Awesome. I'm sad I'm going to miss it. I'll watch it afterwards. Oh, that's me. <laughs> um, all right. Well, then, you know what? Why don't we give them more time? We'll get right to them. Okay. We'll see you for the, uh, see you later in the week, will we? All right. See you later. Sounds good. <laughs> all right. Welcome back live at Drew's house. So as mentioned, we got uh, musicians on the show today. This is, as you know, everybody out there, this is one of my favorite things is when we have music shows. And today is a music show for a great cause. Again, uh, all this great work being done by the New England Musicians Relief Fund. Two people playing big roles in that. Joining me today, Hazel Dean Davis. Hello, Hazel. Hi. That's Hazel. And Will Daly. Hey, Will. Hello. So, uh, so first of all, guys, thanks for coming on. This is great. I really appreciate it. And thanks for all the great work for uh, all the musicians you're doing. Let's start with, um, we have a lot of musicians on this show. Um, you guys have, you know, really made it. Some people are really trying to make their footprints and gain steam and this has just been devastating. Um, it is tough, the pandemic on the songwriter and on the musician these days. Um, just to talk about that struggle a little bit. Um, sure. Um, yeah, so so we've really hit crisis mode here for musicians um, really across the country, but uh, we're focusing on our own community here in New England. And uh, it's especially devastating for freelancers. Um, I don't know, you know how much the audience knows um, about freelance musicians and what it means to be a freelancer. But basically you see and hear us all the time, but you might not really know like where we come from or who we are, or even realize that it's many of the same musicians on different stages on different um, days. So um, freelancers, you know, we're the Boston Pops, we're the extras in the symphony, you know, we're all your regional orchestras, we're in the pit of the ballet, we're in the pit of all the theaters, we're in the jazz clubs, we're in the Latin clubs, we're, you know, we're, we're singing, singing in bars, we're, um, we're the background music at parties, we're the music in your church services. I mean, all of those are, are played by freelance musicians, um, and it's across every genre. And in March, all of that went silent. I mean, just overnight, we suddenly had no live music, no place to play, um, and no, no work means no income. So the freelancers make their money only when they perform. Um, there's no safety net. And because we have so many different employers, um, any, you know, any one of us cobbles together a living, you know, gig to gig, employer to employer. So can get through, you know, we get tax season and we're looking at five different states or more and 12 or more employers. And the government doesn't know what to do with us when it comes to assistance. So we don't fit the mold for unemployment. You know, we get comments from the government like, so which one is your main employer? And we have no answer for them. Like we do not have a main employer. We play music for whoever wants to hear it. 
And um, it just means that, you know, we're, we're, we're all around you. We are the soundtrack to your lives, but we are somewhat invisible uh, in terms of the system. Um, Will, I think that pretty much covers it. I'm not sure what you have to add to that. That was a great answer for that subject. It really does cover it. And um, what's even more interesting is she's talking from a classical musical perspective, but it's the same across the board. Um, yeah. I am a songwriter, and producer, and performer. And to make it work, in normal times, I have a band in Chicago, I have a band in LA, I have a band in Boston, I have players in Europe that I use because I can't afford to take the same people everywhere all the time. And so the trickle down of punishment that comes with the loss of all this goes to all those people when I'm not going out and working and people like me aren't going out and working and finding the players. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's the, the synergy across the industry of, of, of the struggle is, is really telling when you're talking about from a, a songwriter to a French horn player and well, the, the struggle is similar. It's amazing. Well, I uh, want you to answer this one first. What, um, every musician has that kind of different feeling, I guess. I remember where I was kind of when the world stopped. Um, I remember just being here in the living room and going, I think I was watching a basketball game and thinking to myself, that may be the last basketball game we watched in a really long time. Um, and uh, I know everybody has a different story of where they were. Um, do you remember where you were when it kind of hit you and you said, this is probably not good for my business? Oddly enough, in January, I got a call from a promoter in China who was working to bring me over to China in 2020 or as soon as like January, February, 2021. And he wrote me, he's like, we have to, you know, stop our plans for now because, uh, because of this virus. I was like, oh my God, well, good luck with that <laughs> over there. Yeah. And that was January. And then February, I just started to like feel some other, other things coming. But I remember the week when everything shut down, I just had this one uh, private gig. And it's funny now, all the gigs, I don't want to say take, I don't, I don't take them for granted. But a slow month was having six to seven gigs. I could be working on records or other projects or other people's records. But a slow month was having six to seven performances that just kind of came in and requests that popped up. And to Hazel's point, it's like some of that's just from, you know, the relationships you have, the people who know your abilities or fans or whatever it is, they come and, and just ask you to do something. Sometimes it's last minute you get the gig. Sometimes it's a year in planning. And I remember this one private gig that was an ask in January happening in early March. And this person says, we have to cancel. And I, I just thought, all right, well, I can probably get through a month or two right now. Wow. That is crazy. It's, it's certainly, it's, it's, we know so much more now. And actually, it's still a time in the you know, world where we still don't know everything about this virus. But that is, uh, it's crazy to look back even just months ago. Uh, Hazel, how about you? When the world stopped, do you remember that moment? Yeah. Um, uh, so I, when it really stopped for me, I was in a rehearsal. It was the dress rehearsal for the Foray Requiem. And we were having a break um, midway through the rehearsal. And the conductor um, made, said he had an announcement. And he said, you know what? We don't feel like it's safe to continue because we had, you know, singers behind us and, and wind players. And, and so we're going to send you home and we're, we're gonna cancel the concerts this weekend. And that was it, I packed up my horn. It was like March 10th and I have not played with other people for, uh, for money since. Um, I, I had, at the time I had a tours planned for April and also this coming January with the Pops. And we still thought those were gonna happen until like the beginning of April when they were like, oh no, we're gonna push it back to September. And we're like, okay, you know, and then, you know, June, July, and they're like, oh, well, those are gone. You know, September's gone, January's gone. And it's really been just building. We kept thinking, oh, just a few more weeks, you know, but by the, by June, it suddenly, became, you know, we really realized, oh my gosh, this, it's gonna be a long time. That's unbelievable. You were actually sitting down practicing and got pulled yeah. up, wow. So those are two, those are two uh, great examples of liter literally how the world just stopped and things were changed after that. Um, I, I think about this and I, you know, here in New England, we pretty much, we've, you know, entering the winter time now, we all expect this surge, the surge has already kicked in and we expect it to even get worse. Um, I feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe the timing of this 
is not coincidental that, you know what, some, some musicians were able to get back to work, do some stuff during the summertime and the fall when the weather was warm, but are musicians gearing up for a tough winter here because these indoor places, they're just going to kind of go, there's going to be very little room to play. And I can imagine it's going to be very tough on musicians. I mean, there's no room, at least, I mean, nothing is open. And, you know, we were playing outside a little bit. Yeah. Uh, not so much as a, as a singing and as, as wind players, even outside, people are like, whoa, um, you know, and frankly, you know, I, I, I will can speak to this too, um, but certainly for classical musicians, the holidays is when we make a good portion of our annual income, like a third or even up to a half of the annual income. So coming into December, when we usually have, you know, holiday pops and, and nutcracker and all the parties and to, for that to be zero, it's, it's gone from like insanity to zero. Uh, and that on top of unemployment is ending if you manage to qualify for it. Um, maybe we're gonna get another stimulus package, maybe like, you know, fingers crossed, but will that include anything for us invisible freelancers? You know, time will tell. And, and can we hold on long enough to wait? It, it's really, it's really starting to look like a dark place this winter. Mm. That's interesting. Will, it's, did you have more of an opportunity not being a, being a guitar player and where you could get outside and play a little bit? Or are those really, am I overstating that? Ability? So, yeah, I got to um, kind of find a couple spots over the summer in New England where I could play last minute asks. But you also have to remember a lot of this business is planning and is having... I don't like to plan a tour without at least three months out. So you can really market it and plan it and let everyone know and set everything up. So it, it didn't make up for anything. Mm -hmm. really. It just kind of um, <laughs> felt, keep, kept, kept me a little bit more sane, actually. Yeah. To have it. Um, but the, the, the problem is this business and setting up tours, you, it can be a year, six months of planning for some tours. I have tours in Europe. I have tours on the West Coast. And like Hazel was saying, there was hope up until April, maybe even a little bit into May, that they would be in August or September, but they all fall through. Um, it felt really good to get out and play when I did this summer, but uh, it's important to remember when we start to see the light at the end of the tunnel of this massive global challenge, gigs that have singing and people on stage crowd together are last to come online. Those are the most unsafe places for humans to be. It's packed close together with singing happening and air coming through horns and sweating and, and all this stuff. Um, so we're last in line here. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we'll be first in line for vaccines or, or anything like that. So um, that's what makes this so important and what makes this next four months so scary. Um, because there's like everything Hazel said about government preparedness for the kind of gig workers that we are and, and just the absence of anything that we can do, especially in New England with weather the way it is. And Hazel, and again, we're talking about the um, New England Musicians Relief Fund here uh, with Will Daly and Hazel Dean Davis. Uh, Hazel, what uh, I imagine the musician and like the, the theater you know, the theaters and these venues, they're all kind of aligned as one because I've had some theater owners on too and they're like, we're trying, we're doing anything we can to think outside the box. We're doing the virtual thing like everybody else. And of course that is tough to translate sometimes. And, but, you know, I, he says uh, most, of the, most of the theater owners I've spoken with have said uh, the community is doing the best they can, but it is a struggle. Um, uh, you know, t speak to the theaters and the places you guys play, all kind of being one family in this regard. I mean, absolutely. You know, we all work together. And as Will said, you know, it's it's this whole ripple effect. It's not just the musicians, and then it's everything that supports the music making. And, you know, people, uh, people are trying, but there's very little that can actually be done. Like, you know, some string percussion players can play with masks safely, um, especially if they're getting testing, but it's, it's almost um, impossible to have any real work for wind players and singers um, and for theaters to really open for audiences. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just not allowed right now. And for good reason. I mean, I'm, 
it's not safe. It's not safe right now, as Will was saying. It's just we're going to be the last ones um, to get back on board. And that you know that is really why we started the relief fund um, because there there are no good options. It, in, it, we need the government to step up. And you know, in the meantime, um, we're tr we're we created this relief fund to try to bridge the gap for people. Um, there are no good good solutions. So uh, we're just trying to to find you know um, audience members and community members that care and that can help and taking in those donations and t turning around and immediately getting them out to musicians who need help putting food on the table and getting through this month. And it's just, you know, people are living day to day at this point. And, you know, uh, Will, and I'll talk about this in a second, but Will is a, uh, you know, a solo artist with other musicians that he plays with, as you kind of mentioned before, all over the map. Um, you are very much, Hazel, uh, a part of a big collective thing. And I wonder what is morale with all your fellow musicians uh, is it is it okay is there somebody who's upbeat in that group uh, is there's nobody upbeat in that group <laughs> i mean you know we're a very resilient crew you know we're used to having to fight for for what we um, love doing i mean we didn't pick this these jobs we didn't pick this life because we thought it was going to bring in a lot of money you know we we do this because it's our passion and we love it and we can't imagine doing anything else so you know we will keep fighting and we will fight to survive and we will fight to find a way to make art but um you know just because we're used to fighting doesn't mean it's any easier to be starving <laughs> it's this is our, and we're right now we can't make the art like we gave up everything to to make art our, our living and right now to be unable to do that to be unable to express ourselves to be unable to feel the energy back from the audience you know we're left just feeling helpless at least that's how i feel yeah and, and will as i look at uh, as i look at your setup here it is i believe it's familiar to me i think i have seen you do a virtual performance from there or i, I could be wrong but i think you've done some virtual performances from that exact seat is that right yeah, um, I started, I started, uh, I mean, to, to Hazel's point again, um, we know what we sign up for when you do arts and especially in America. And um, you don't, you, you're doing it because of your drive and your passion and, and the calling of it. But um, you have these faculties that get you through the, those, those bumps and those hills and those valleys for them to last nine months straight for you to exhaust your resilience in a month, it, it becomes, it starts to feel demoralizing and insurmountable to so many. And um, I started out to, to that, you know, what you were saying there from here, I was streaming. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the part of it that said, okay, the ground always shifts beneath an artist's feet. We're used to that. We don't, we don't um, pretend to, to to exist on steady, solid ground. So I just started streaming to raise funds for the venues that I play at around New England, thinking this will be a month or two. And that was me just reacting. That's our job sometimes as a musician is to react, as an artist is to react to the moment, to react to the other people on stage, to react to the conductor. And, um, and then I remember two months passed and I've raised all this money. I'm, sending PayPal's to all these bartenders and, and sound engineers. And I was like, oh, I really don't have a plan for myself right now. I don't know what I'm doing. And this doesn't look like it's stopping. And I kind of fell into my own little rut. Um, and I mean, what I lo love about this fund is it, it gives us something to focus on for each other um, and to fight for and to raise awareness about mm -hmm. this struggle. Fell into a rut. I imagine that's a uh, term that a lot of us can relate to in uh, 2020. Uh, Hazel, you've already uh, elaborated on how so many of your fellow musicians are kind of there right now. Um, talk about the, uh, you mentioned that the government needs to do more. What is the number one thing or maybe a one in a one A that like needs to be done tomorrow? Not like, let's talk about this in Washington for a couple months, but like what could be done tomorrow to help the musician? Well, they need to extend the unemployment um, right now, even with the extension that was given in, in March. Um, many people, for many people, um, it's ending the week of Christmas um, and you aren't even allowed to reapply, you know, until, until well into 2021. So they need, 
they need to change the rules for this. Um, this is a pandemic that doesn't fit into our normal calendar years, our rules. So they, they need to extend that. Uh, and frankly, there needs to be some uh, recognition of the, the peril, uh, you know, the, the challenges for art workers. I, I have not, I've yet to hear Governor Baker mention art or music. Um, Mayor Walsh has, has said more, but you know, we hear a lot about restaurant workers and, and you know, a lot about um, even some gig workers, you know, they're talking about Uber drivers and, and th those people are also in crisis, but there's just been a total absence of, of talk about musicians and arts workers. And we just need to get the word out and help. We need help. I mean, the, you know, whether it's a check, whether it's a, uh, extended unemployment, whether it's finding a way for us to, to play online in, in, you know, in a way that actually earns um, some income, I, you know, something, anything. <laughs> Will, do you feel that same sense of, uh, of left behind from government and uh, officials? Uh, definitely, definitely. And the complications of applying for anything are really difficult when, as you said, you have different employers or I make my money out of state by touring. Um, it gets really confusing, um, not often set up for the artist's brain to navigate. And um, I think there needs to be some sort of recognition of the challenges. And if it comes too late, the trickle down of that on everyone else is immense and it's often never measured. Art is the equity of humankind. And it extends beyond the work. We're, uh, France makes millions and billions of dollars a year off the Louvre, which is art that's been created hundreds of years before. And when a musician goes and plays in a bar, they're bringing people out. The bartender makes money. Uh, when it's, there's successful clubs and there's a successful symphony hall, the real estate around that area does better. The, then the landlords make mo more money. The restaurants do better. Um, there is this symbiotic relationship to the whole process of the performer and the artist in that, that collecting of human spirits getting in a room and participating in music that if we don't have healthy soil for that, everything suffers. So yes, we need help, but if you don't help us, and you don't participate in that truth, the whole economy suffers. Mm. Well said. Um, and you know, you talk, we talked a little bit here so far about the streaming thing and obviously, Will, you've tried to, you can see your setup behind you. You've tried to embrace this a little bit. Um, I know it's kind of weird not getting that big applause and that big cheer coming back at you. I've heard many artists say, uh, uh, still my favorite answer to that is, um, a man by the name of Ryan Montblou who makes great music and I've said this a few times but he uh, he came on and he said I, I gotta tell you I told my girlfriend and uh, her daughter that we need to stop with the clapping because it just sounds like a sad bar every time I play a song so so we put it into that that's still my favorite answer but there are many things that are different about virtual playing and streaming um, the one thing I do find is that when all this happened I know I did I know some, everybody in my little bubble did the same thing they went on they went to find their favorite musicians they they embraced this streaming oh thank goodness he or she is playing this and and i realized that when everything kind of went to hell people ran to the musicians yes and so i, I think there's a little kind of um what's the word a real sadness that uh they are the ones struggling so much right now because we really did go to the arts when it was all going to hell right i think that's really important i mean music people go to music, like you just said, people rely on music when, you know, when they're celebrating, when they're grieving, when they're frustrated, you know, people go to music for, 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 for help and, uh, you know, to, to, as a way to deal with their emotions and especially around the holidays, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone has these rituals and these, um, you know, annual celebrations, and it almost always involves music and often live music. And, you know, it's going to be really disappointing for everybody this season to have no Nutcracker, no holiday pops, you know, it's not the same online, 
you know, it's something, but it's not the same. And, you know, so it's disappointing for everyone to have a quiet holiday season, but it is devastating for the musicians. Um, and that's, you know, again, what we're, we love to be the givers. That's what we do. We want to be there for your celebrations, for, for your moment of, of grief. We want to, to provide that solace. Um, and this would not, but now we actually need help. And it's hard for musicians to ask. It's not natural. We want to be the givers. And this is something we've really struggled with, with, with the relief fund is it took a while to convince musicians to apply. Like, no, really we want to help you, you know, but every musician is like, no, we're helpers. We're gonna do it. We're gonna, you know, and um, so we're really asking the community, you know, this time we need help. Um, and if you can support us now, we promise to be there for you when you need us after the pandemic. But if we can't make it, if we can't get through it, people are going to have to leave the industry. And the, as Will was saying, the entire community is going to suffer. Hey, so give me an idea too, because it did strike me. I don't know, I have no idea of the actual uh, balance sheet of how it all is laid out, but compare you know, this, what would a normal holiday season for you look like? I mean, are we talking seven nights a week, sometimes two shows? Uh, lay that out for me. Yeah, um, I can say I, you know, I made the mistake of looking back at last December, um, and I think I played um, over 40 concerts, and it was I ended up being uh, a third of my annual income came in during the month of December. So we're talking a lot. <laughs> this is a lot of work lost. Yeah. And Will, I, I'm sure yours is a little bit different. I, I don't know if you rely strictly on the uh, holidays as much. I, I, sure, I can't imagine relying as much as, as, as that line of work. But um, what has been the, was it the summertime that was a tough blow for you? Or was it just? Summertime, I was supposed to be in Europe. I was supposed to go play with like Kings of Leon and Pearl Jam at the end of September to close out a West Coast run. Oh. Um, and, you know, I was... I was composing music for a, a podcast about travel with a big marketing company. You know, it was like a great paycheck. And it's like, well, they're not going to put out this podcast about travel right now, you know. Um, all these things is just, uh, uh, it, it is really an, uh, um, a 12-month process for bringing in the annual income. And what really I had to sit back and just take stock in and doing the work over all the years, even if you have a month where you're not touring uh you like i said you still have six to seven shows and you don't even consider it that you're playing at all that month or something like that um if you're like recording a record or something and um to think another aspect of losing artists to the professional artist culture and having to enter the workforce that's the last thing everyone wants to because you do not want a bunch of people who know how to work 24 hours a day without vacation, without benefits, entering the workforce for other people's jobs. We know, you know, that's like, that would be the kiss of death for everyone else trying to get jobs. If I found out one day I went to get a job, I'm like, wait, I have weekends off and I get paid for vacation and I have six days and I have health insurance. Great. <laughs> you do not want me coming for that job. You know, and I know how to like, send out emails and do marketing and perform and write and produce a studio. You know, Hazel's putting this whole fun together and, and running it. Like you want to keep us where we're at <laughs> because it's better <laughs> for all the other job openings. <laughs> so think of, think of investing in this fund as protecting your own job. If, the, if nothing else works, if nothing else doesn't pull uh, at your empathy or your connectedness to arts and music, just look at it as job security. <laughs> that is that is fantastic. I'm good. Well, thanks for like. Perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Great perspective. My dog enjoyed it too. Did you hear that? He, he yeah. was, Welcome back. It's like we took a commercial break. How about that? Yeah. I have to let the dog. This is you have to let the dogs out when you're doing shows from home in the kitchen. I'm not used to. Do, well, I am getting more used to doing it from the kitchen. It's kind of weird. We used to. We have this nice, beautiful studio out of uh, Newburyport that we use, and we can play. You know, musicians come in and they say it's a great sounding room and. And now I'm here in my kitchen, but they, we have good coffee still, so. Yeah, it looks like a nice kitchen. Looks like you no. need to refill your wine rack, though. Yes, that is true. 
I'm going to have to do that. Pandemic, you got to keep that full during a pandemic. We're usually pretty good about it. I will. Uh, I'm actually happy you called me out for it because it's, my wife does the wine. I do the, uh, I'm more of a whiskey drinker, but uh, yeah, I'll make sure it's filled for the next time we, uh, but <laughs> she gets home maybe. <laughs> um, all right. So anyway, basically we left off with Will's, uh, great talk about how uh, you do not want artists entering the real workforce. So that's, uh, that's a fantastic. <laughs> but I, I do, uh, I do want to ask a little bit about, um, about going, has the community, uh, I, I know you're hoping that they really show up here and I know people are struggling, so they have to, you're asking for help from people who, who can give, who can afford to do it. Um, what has the, the feedback or, or have you felt any, lending of a hand from the community? I mean, has it mostly been good? It's hard, Hazel, in your case, because you're part of such a big collaboration. It's like, how do we, how do we help Hazel? Is it by helping the whole big picture? How could you answer that one? Yeah, we are feeling, we are feeling supported. Um, at first, when we started the Relief Fund in June, um, you know, it was mostly musicians giving to musicians, which we were like, this is not the right idea, right? We're just musicians who are barely holding on trying to lend a hand to somebody who's slightly, you know, more or worse off. But, you know, word is getting out. Um, it's always hard to get beyond your own circles, um, whatever you're doing. So we're really happy, thanks to people like you, to get the word out into um, the whole community. And we are getting um, donations in. We are also, um, and again, this is both good and, and bad, you know, we are, the word is getting out to musicians and we have, um, we're just being flooded with applications, which is the whole point. It's, you know, we, that we want everyone to apply and we want to be able to help. And our goal um, is, you know, was to uh, help 200 musicians get $1,000 out to 200 musicians before the holidays. We have more than 200 applications in, so we are going to meet that demand assuming we can get enough money to do so. Um, we're, we're just about there donation wise, but this is not gonna end on Christmas day. You know, this musicians are gonna continue to struggle. Um, as Will said, we're gonna be the last to return even when vaccines, uh, you know, start to be available. So we're looking at many more months of needing to support musicians. So we're going to be continuing to come, uh, come to you and come to the community and ask for support to get through the holidays, to get past the holidays, to get to next summer, where we're really hoping things can start to come back. Yeah, I mean, we're already, you know, we're already one more than a week into December. So that gives you an idea of how fast tracked this thing needs to be. I mean, you're talking yeah. getting this signed, sealed, delivered and out to the people who need it by Christmas, so. Yes, it is a huge undertaking. I mean, it is a labor of love. Um, you know, I, I would rather be playing my horn, but I am really happy to be committing my time to help the community. And then Will, I was just playing off that a little bit. You had mentioned you were going to tour with uh, Pearl Jam and Kings of Leon. You said, it, did I have that right? That was a festival I was going to play in September. Yeah. Yeah. How about like some, because I, I mean, you guys all talk, musicians are all talking. Um, are some of those bigger bands, I mean, I know they're tuned into it. Um, are, are they helping out. I mean, sometimes you, you look at the top of your industry to kind of be leaders in that regard. Um, and I know it's not all about musicians helping musicians, but let's face it, there are some bands and some musicians who are on top of the world in a lot of ways. Is, has, has that been felt at all? Or? Um, I think a lot of, yeah, they, they are. Um, a lot of those big entity bands who have lots of employees got PPE loans easily, right? So they so that they could keep their salaries going for you know some a large band will have thirty employees, you know, um, and uh, they are participating in things like save our stages and stuff like that. But I don't know. I, I think at that level, they're not often aware as much of the independent artists and what it's like to be a working independent artist. Um, no matter how good their intentions are um, yeah so uh this um but if they're out there and they're listening look us up <laughs> yeah. I, this is important this is for new england and this, this is important for for new england to pay attention to at the business level at the state level um because you're not just again you're not just helping out artists here you're helping out the economy that you live and thrive in. 
you know, to that point, I was I was talking to a buddy of mine. I mean, I'm I'm 33, so I'm you know I'm I'm not at that age where you know I lived in Boston. I did four or five years living in the city, you know, out of college, and I know that's a very popular thing to do. My buddy has a younger younger uh, brother, and he's telling me that you know, yeah, they just actually moved out of the city because you know what, Boston's really not that cool if there's no place to go <laughs> and there's no shows to see you know it's it's not it's it's still the city but it, it doesn't have what the city has to offer and that speaks to exactly what you're talking about exactly absolutely i mean i moved here five years ago um after playing in virginia symphony for 11 years and i moved here because of the 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 vibrant intellectual and artistic um scene in greater boston and throughout new england and people take it for granted um but Listen, if musicians can't hold on through this pandemic, it can't, it's not going to return easily. Mm -hmm. Like what you took for granted is not, you know, is not a, a given. It, it has to be supported. And your landlords will be the first, first to really realize it when, um, you know, 21 to 38 year olds don't want to move here and start renting a place to start engaging in the city with a new tech job or the bio job or the That's university right. job or whatever it is. It became, I'll take that job there because Boston's exciting. It's beautiful. It's interesting. It's got food, culture, and music, but it's uh, increasingly difficult for, for artists to live here. I mean, it, it's been that way long before this, mm -hmm. um, but uh I think artists for a long time have been sounding that alarm. I've put a lot of my work in there by trying to create opportunities for artists. Um, I, I like created a concert series on the rooftop of Fenway and uh, curate Harpoon Fest and a bunch of other things so that there's kind of this ladder of ascension of opportunities in town. But uh, it's been difficult for a long time in Boston. And it's difficult for New England artists because there's not a hub of the business here and you you pay a little price for that but you gain a lot i think in the um the new englandness of this area of the world it's a wonder you know i've toured everywhere it's just a wonderful place to live as an artist i thrive off of that more than mm -hmm. i do the business but um yeah um we've been sounding the alarm and if, if we don't participate in um the structure of our arts everyone else paid a price and it's not just boston either we're where this show is out of newburyport which is i always say is a nice little music city there's some great places on the water and little little clubs along the way and i live in danvers which is where my where, where i am right now um and the, you know salem all these little cities around that are just really good music spots and um i, I mean they're all they're all struggling and it's it, i can see it all i can see people being drawn away from these places it's it's crazy to think about um, well, thank you guys for handling that one. Again, Will Daly and Hazel Dean Davis joining us, New England Musicians Relief Fund. Um, it's just a great cause. How can people donate? I mean, we should make sure that gets out there, Hazel. Uh, why don't you so um, it's, it's really easy. Just go to the website, N-E-M-R-F, stands for New England Musician Relief Fund, dot org. And you can um, just click the button to donate. Uh, you can also click the button to apply, um, depending on which end you're coming from. And um, please check it out. We have a great campaign um, going where we're asking musicians to make videos, um, just talking about what it's like to be a musician uh, during this pandemic and you know, to, to get the word out about the fund. And you can go to the website, it's under the community section, um, and you can listen to all these amazing musicians talk about being a musician now. Um, it is, you know, re everyone says this is such an unprecedented time and you can get sick of hearing that, but it, it really does feel like an unprecedented time uh, to be uh, alive um, and certainly to be a musician. Uh, so you can see, you know, Will's got a video, I've got a video, Keith Lockhart has a video, um, Sons of Sarah Dip have a video. I mean, so many uh, amazing artists across all the genres have videos up there. So definitely check it out um, while you're there. That's nice of you to mention that people can apply to because I know there's no shortage on that list and you know you're not exactly looking for more people but um I mean please apply you know we we are we are determined to keep up with the applications you know and we are fighting every day to to reach more donors and we want everyone that needs help to apply and we're going to do our absolute best to get um help out to 
to you as fast as possible. Um, we usually, uh, thank you guys very much. This has been um, fantastic. It's nice to meet you both. I know first time on the show, so thank you for coming on um, and uh, really getting these uh, stories out there and, uh, and really the plight of the musician and the independent artists right now and the freelancers. It's, um, it's a brutal time. Uh, we, do us we usually end the show on a little bit of a light note where I want to kind of meet you guys individually. Can we do some rapid fire? Just uh, first thing that comes to your mind? Absolutely. Sure. All right, let's, we'll keep it structured. So, Hazel, you mind taking the first one on all these? I sure. All right. Favorite musical artist of all time, Hazel? Oh, my God. Gypsy well, King? You, say it again. The Gypsy Kings? Okay. Will? Um, uh, uh, favorite musical artist of all time? I got to go faster than this. This is horrible. I know. That was just the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> I just popped, my, my head just popped with Joan Armatrading. Okay. I would love to replay the tape in slow motion of your reactions when I asked that. You both had the same reaction. Hazel looked <laughs> up, Will went down. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to play that back, I think. That was fantastic. Oh my gosh. You know what? Maybe we'll, we'll go a little bit lighter then. Favorite food, Hazel? Oof. Um... I think e either fruit salad or hummus. Not together. Thai food. What was it, Will? I talked over you, sorry. Thai food. Fried food? Okay. Thai food. Favorite city, not Boston, to perform in? Chicago. Oof. Um, New York? New York. Makes sense. Best show you've ever played. The one night that you say, now that's the night. Always choose <laughs> Oh, I'm, am I still first? Oh, geez. Yeah, you're supposed uh, to be first. I think definitely playing with the Boston Symphony. Maybe when we... Um, Oh, well, so either playing with Boston Symphony at Carnegie or playing Britain Serenade with a Far Cry. Will, your extreme stress on this? I know. I, I'm always chasing that night. So even when I have it, think I have it, I'd say I, that wasn't it. Because I've never played with the Boston Symphony, so I, I imagine that will be it. <laughs> but, um, Can we make this happen? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> it's in 2022. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I uh, played on stage with um, Willie Nelson once, and that was amazing. But I played on stage with Eddie Vedder once, and I was actually scared because the crowd was so intense. Yeah. And I was so, um, it was so overwhelming and, and electric. Um, that, was, that was pretty amazing. But my, all right, my favorite time was I was in France, and the, uh, the Bataclan attacks had happened. Um, when I was on tour, and we were shut down for a week and a half from the tour that we were having. And to promo uh, the promoter of the tour said, all right, you're, you're going to be allowed to play one more show before it's over. The day, the day they're going to allow you to play again is the last day of the tour. And it's a one o'clock show during the day on a Wednesday. I was like, who goes to a show at a theater on a Wednesday? And I'm like, that's what do you mean? That's what we do here. I was like, well, where am I? But I wasn't in America. So uh, it was at one o'clock in a theater. 500 people came in. Mind you, eight days after this horrible attack in the country. And it was one of the most emotional shows ever because um, it was their first time listening to music after that had happened. And uh, it was my first time playing. And it was absolutely incredible. Wow. That is, that is a good story. I'm glad we, uh, that, that's good, that's great. Um, and that's, this will kind of derail us from rapid fire, but I want both of you to answer this because- I'm off rapid fire, I'm so sorry, I've messed up rapid fire. We, we have had so many longer rapid fire answers, trust me. <laughs> there, there are people unfamiliar with the concept that we have had on this show, trust me. Um, but I, I will, uh, I'm just curious, because Will, you mentioned that, that feeling of, um, I have heard very different answers from artists when they play in front of these big crowds of like, it's really no different, 10 people, you know, 1,000 people, whatever. It's all kind of just a mass of people and you're just doing your thing. Other people are like, no, you noticed it. You noticed it with Pearl Jam. What is it like playing in front of those big audiences with well, all that? Well, that gig I was talking about was in front of 1,000 people. Okay. 
in, in, in a, on a 900 person club. <laughs> so it was just scary. It was like really intense to begin with. Yeah. And, um, but I, I do generally agree with that. And, and, I feel like if I can't see everyone's face, I feel like I can't do my job as well sometimes. Like I, I really enjoy like 500 people most and five people can be just, you know, I've, I, I have, I, they're considered shows in my head and in my heart where I've been in a room with five, 10 people and it's just transcended. Yeah. Um, so it, it is, it is kind of, it is kind of tough and, you know, I remember being on that Willie Nelson stage at the end of his his set one night, just singing. And um, there's a good ten thousand people out there. That was pretty wild. Yeah, and Hazel, you must you must really feel it, especially probably around the holidays. You get these, you know, these big. This is what you geared up for. These are the big shows of the year. What what's that like? Is that like an adrenaline rush? Oh, for sure, um, yeah. definitely an adrenaline rush. You know, usually for the as classical musicians, our audiences tend to be slightly more tame. But um, I was on tour with uh, Cincinnati Pops in Taiwan. And Cincinnati Pops, I mean, it, it's a pop orchestra, but it's, you know, it's still a classical um, group. But in, in Taiwan, they, these are like pop stars. Like the, the crowd was like, whoa! And we're not used to that. It was awesome. <laughs> um, so it's, it's nice sometimes to, to, to get treated like a pop star. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it's every concert is is a rush, um, and you know, some more than others. But it's a good T-shirt, I think. It's nice sometimes to be treated like a pop star. We can work with that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what's the, uh, or maybe it's a really bad T-shirt. I don't know. What's the, um, what is the uh, horror story? There has to be like one. I love hearing the ones of just like it was the night. Like I, I was, uh, it was, it was terrible. Everything went wrong. Um, and I mean, you guys are both so established now that, uh, I think you can probably comfortably say this, but, uh, that moment that said, this is going to take some comeback, uh, comeback effort. Hmm. Think sound not working, terrible crew, bad audience. I don't know. I mean, yeah, you know, by this point in my career, I've had a bit of, a bit of all <laughs> that. you know, you have the concert where there's almost nobody there. Um, you know, you have the concert where you're not sure you're going to make it home because it's a blizzard and you're, you're on a bus and, oh, yeah. you know, it's like, uh, you're sliding all over the place. Um, I, I had a concert where it was really cold before, um, I went on stage. And so I slipped on a, a hot pink fleece, uh, and then I proceeded to meander onto stage and, uh, start playing. And we were well into the overture when I realized that I was still wearing said pink fleece. And I like am looking out and all my wondering, where were my colleagues and why didn't they mention it? You know, they're all sitting right next to me in their concert black and I'm in hot pink and just like in between pieces, like trying to just slip it off quietly with, you know, but it was like, it was so embarrassing. <laughs> oh, tell me there's video of that. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Will, can you match the uh, pink fleece? Um, when I was, um, in third grade, I did violin and I kind of did like a different instrument every year from kindergarten to fourth grade, fifth grade. And I was so bad at the violin. I knew it. And I just, I want to say like, I was, my professionalism started then because in the recital, I took the violin and just turned it over and just threw the, the bow against the back of the violin. Cause I knew I wasn't any good. And I just did that. And my, my parents were in the audience just looking, what the hell is he doing? And I was like, I'm not going to run this piece for everybody. I don't know, what, I don't know what's going on here. Might as well make it a comedy. Um, I remember walking out one night. with I was playing with Pete Yorn, and I was really excited to play with Pete Yorn. And I was opening up for him at, a, at an old theater, like um, built in the 30s or 40s, and walked out. We had a great sound check, and we walked out to open up that show, full band band starts playing we start singing nothing's coming out and then we we see all these people scrambling on the side the PA had died just before we walked out and oh. the guys in my band who cannot stand that kind of stuff just start stressing and biting their nails and pacing on stage and I remember thinking well what do you what do we do, what do, here? do? it's gonna be a long time because then we stop playing and everyone's scrambled on stage these texts to fix everything but I grabbed an acoustic guitar from the side and I walked out 
and started playing acoustic in this old theater that was designed to not have PAs. It was designed to just be acoustic like that. And it was one of the best sounds I've ever achieved live. It sounded so grand and huge. And of course, audience people, audiences love that. Most of our job is not to be perfect. It's to be real. Yeah. And um, it made that show extra special that, that it felt it that it went horribly in the beginning, so. Um, I love that. Yeah, I do too. And can I take that ball and run with it, Wilk, since I see a guitar behind you? Can you play us out, you think? I can do that, yeah. <laughs> um, Hazel, Dean Davis, Will Daly, thank you uh, guys both so much. Um, Hazel, one last thing. I know we have so many musicians on this show that play a lot and that are struggling. What is your, what is your message to the musician out there trying to get through this? Um, you know, hang on, apply to the Relief Fund. We want to help. Uh, and audiences are stepping up. They do want you to get through it. We need your music. Er, you know, we want you to be able to play. The audience needs you. The community is going to need music to build, to build the community back. Um, so just hang on and let us know how we can help. Hazel Dean Davis, Will Daly, thank you guys so much. It is the New England Musicians Relief Fund. Go look into it. Go give if you can and help out these musicians. That's who we ran to in the darkest of moments when the world stops. So remember that. Uh, Will Daly, going to uh, play us out. You good? I'm good. Thanks. We'll see you next time, everybody, live at Drew's house. Bye-bye now. done there's that sad bar sound yeah. <laughs> will that was great thank you man appreciate you doing that on the fly my pleasure thank you and, th and thank the both of you we wish you both the best will daily hazel dean davis uh, i was great to meet you virtually and we'll see you on the road hopefully sooner rather than later someday again right 
Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us.